This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Donald Trump is facing four criminal trials, two over his efforts to overturn the 2020 election, with the federal charges specifically accusing him of conspiring to obstruct the congressional confirmation of Joe Biden's victory on January 6th. Despite that, Trump remains far and away the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination. But now the former president is facing a different legal battle that could sideline him. An effort to keep him off the ballot. Prominent liberal and conservative scholars are increasingly raising a constitutional argument that Trump's actions on January 6th disqualify him under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars people from holding office if they took an oath to support the Constitution and later engaged in insurrection or rebellion. My guest is one of those liberal scholars, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard Law School. He's written an article in The Atlantic with former federal judge Michael Ludig entitled, The Constitution Prohibits Trump from Ever Being President Again. For those who haven't heard about the 14th Amendment's disqualification clause, will you explain it and its relevance to Trump? Sure. After the Civil War, the framers of the 14th Amendment, which was one of the main provisions that basically restructured the Constitution and made it possible for the Confederate states to rejoin the Union. After the Civil War, the framers of the 14th Amendment wanted to protect against anyone in the future who would take an oath to support the Constitution and then turn their back on it and engage in basically treason against the Republic by fomenting or engaging in or giving aid and comfort to an insurrection against the Constitution of the United States. And so there was a very explicit provision written into the 14th Amendment, which became part of the Constitution in 1868, saying that anyone like that could never again hold office, any office in the United States, not just president, but, you know, anything down to dog catcher. However, that disability could be lifted by a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress, so that that was a safeguard against this being abused. This hasn't been used very often since the Civil War, but that's because we haven't had very many people who've taken an oath to the Constitution and then basically made war on the Constitution itself by doing the kind of thing that many people believe Donald Trump did, namely encouraging an insurrection trying to have fake ballots, the whole nine yards, basically trying to undo the Constitution's main, sort of the beating heart of the Constitution, the part that is guaranteed from the beginning of the Republic that we would transfer power peacefully from one president to the next. The Civil War was one kind of insurrection. What happened on the lead up to January 6th was another. And so a number of people around the country, including a very conservative former federal judge, Judge Michael Ludig, and I have been writing about this constitutional provision, which many people think, including us, applies like a glove to Donald J. Trump. And whether that is or is not going to keep him off the ballot is something that's being teed up for litigation all around the country. So Trump is facing two criminal trials over his efforts to overturn the election results. Some people might say we should wait to see if he's convicted before we see if he falls under Section 3. Yeah, that would be a big mistake because this section has nothing to do with punishing someone for crimes. In fact, one of the main reasons that it was written was the recognition that the president at the time, Andrew Johnson, wasn't about to have a Justice Department prosecute anyone for anything that was related to the attempt to overturn the Constitution of the United States. He, in fact, Johnson, pardoned insurrectionists. So they wanted a provision that was quite independent of criminal prosecution or of civil suit that would operate directly to disqualify anyone who took an oath and then engaged in or gave aid and comfort to an insurrection against the Constitution. So whatever happens in these criminal trials, which are very important in terms of holding various people, not just Donald Trump, but the 18 others that Fannie Willis has indicted under the RICO statute or the unindicted co-conspirators, 
many of whom may end up being indicted by Jack Smith, whatever happens to them has to do with whether they spend years in prison or not, not on whether they can again hold power. That's a different matter. This disqualification, therefore, has nothing to do with the pending criminal proceedings. Is it a problem or a concern that several judgment calls have to be made on this issue that there's no clear authority on and it's still being debated? For example, does Congress have to pass a law to enforce the ban? So well, there... it's pretty clear to, to me and to Judge Ludig and to the conservative scholars who have written a major piece about this that Congress needn't pass a law to enforce it. It's simply self-enforcing in the sense that anyone who engages in an insurrection after taking an oath or gives aid and comfort to it is disqualified. That doesn't mean that it kind of leaps up off the page and points directly to Donald Trump or Rudy Giuliani or anybody else. It does have to be applied. And that's why there are lawsuits that are being planned as we speak, lawsuits against various secretaries of state and other lawsuits saying that in the discharge of their responsibility to decide who is on the ballot, they need to conduct hearings on whether indeed Donald Trump did what it appears that he did, namely engage in or give aid and comfort to an insurrection. That won't happen without hearings. Those hearings are going to be independently important, valuable, educational. Hopefully they'll be tried on television. They're not criminal trials. They're going to be evidentiary hearings to determine the kind of thing that the January 6th committee determined and to determine who was engaged in this insurrection and who was disqualified. I know a Florida lawyer last week filed one of the first challenges to Trump running under the 14th Amendment. He said it was your analysis and Judge Ludig that convinced him. On Monday, a Michigan resident filed a challenge there. So, Sorry to interrupt. But sure. That lawsuit, I mean, it's very nice that he says Judge Ludig and I persuaded him, but he doesn't really have any obvious standing in that case. He says that he's injured because he voted ever since he was 18. Well, that doesn't entitle him to sue Donald Trump, as far as I can tell. It's competitors to Donald Trump who might sue. And in some states, the voters have standing to bring lawsuits against the Secretary of State to get an injunction to order the Secretary of State to conduct the proceeding to decide who is disqualified. Those are the suits that I would watch more seriously. Free speech for people is sending letters to secretaries of states, asking them to bar Trump from the ballot, and actually including draft language for a declaration that could be used to exclude him from primary ballots. Do you see that as a way to go, to appeal to secretaries of states? It seems to me that's a first step. That is either free speech for people or some other group could even be Chris Christie or Asa Hutchinson, could ask secretaries of state in states whose laws provide for this to conduct proceedings to decide whether or not Donald Trump is eligible to vote. I think simply asking a secretary of state to make a declaration may be a little bit short-circuiting what should happen. It seems to me that secretaries of state should be asked to make a determination which may involve taking evidence and conducting hearings and then declaring their conclusion. So you write that these disqualification efforts will naturally lead to the courts and there'll be conflicting rulings. So will this necessarily end at the Supreme Court with its super conservative majority? I think that's very likely. And that's why I've said in many contexts that this will be quite a test for the Supreme Court whether it is going to be influenced beyond the law and beyond reason by its conservative inclinations, conservative in a partisan sense. Conservatives like Judge Ludig and like Professors Bodie and Paulson, who wrote the blockbuster article that's coming out soon explaining why this provision means what it says, their conservatism leads them to say that Donald Trump is disqualified. A lot of people worry, me among them, that some of the conservatives on the current court are not as principled as we would like. And so I certainly wouldn't you know, bet a great deal on the court doing what I think the law 
requires it to do in this situation. So the ultimate outcome of these efforts may be to educate the public and to focus on the degree to which Donald Trump cannot be trusted to enforce the Constitution and preserve democracy. That may be the principal effect, whether it keeps him off the ballot in the long run and the ultimate confrontation with with the incumbent president is a different matter and harder to predict. Timing seems to be a problem. There's limited time. Do you think that this can get to the Supreme Court before the primaries are over? Well, I think there's a very good chance it will. Things can move very quickly through the courts when the courts see that they will become moot unless something is is done. I mean, it would be quite a disaster for the nominee of a major political party to be running at a time when the primaries are over, the convention is over, and then there is litigation over whether that person needs to be taken off the ballot because of a constitutional disability. That's not the right time to do it. The right time to do it is before the convention. In your article, you mentioned the concerns of former federal judge and Stanford law professor Michael McConnell, who has written that empowering partisan politicians, such as state secretaries of state, to disqualify their political opponents from the ballot deprives voters of electing candidates of their choice, and if abused, could be profoundly anti-democratic. How do you answer his concerns? Well, Judge Ludig and I have both said that he has it backwards. It's the most democratic thing of all to insist that the constitutional provision designed to protect democracy from those who would overturn it in violation of the rule of law to ensure that that's enforced. To say that the people have a right to elect whomever they want is to ignore the fact that a lot of people that someone might want to elect, a lot of Democrats might want to elect Barack Obama again. But under the Constitution, he can't run again because of the term limit. Some people might want to elect a brilliant 34-year-old, but that person is not qualified to run. Some people, I think, would like to elect you know, someone who is not a natural-born citizen. But they can't do that because someone like Janet Granholm, who's a very impressive woman, was born in Canada. Democracy doesn't mean having your way no matter what. It means abiding by the rule of law. And certainly part of the rule of law is that those who try to shred it the way that Donald Trump actually said that he would like to terminate the Constitution. Judge Ludwig and I quote his language to that effect in our article in The Atlantic. Democracy can't survive with people like that being presented as Pied Pipers to lead the country down a primrose path toward terrible anti-democratic destruction. The only time I saw that this provision in 150 years has been used to disqualify an official was a state judge in New Mexico who removed a county commissioner from office because he participated in the January 6th attack. Is that the only time you know of, too? Well, that's the only modern time. There may be some earlier ones. Certainly when Madison Cawthorn was ruled by the Fourth Circuit to be disqualified under this provision, that became moot. So that happened fairly recently, but it became moot when he lost his re-election attempt. So there are some recent efforts, but we shouldn't get distracted by how rarely this provision has been used. It's been used rarely because we rarely have people take an oath to the Constitution and then become actively engaged in trying to overturn it. You acknowledge in the article, you and Judge Ludic, that this could give rise to, quote, momentary social unrest and even violence. So does that mitigate against using it in our already divided country? No, because that would give power to destroy democracy and end the rule of law to those people who threaten violence. We have to have the courage of our convictions. We can't simply turn our backs on the Constitution because some people brandish weapons and say that if you enforce it, you'll get a bullet in the back. I mean, that's what a lot of people are saying now in the pending proceedings, criminal and civil, against people like Donald Trump. And we just cannot let the terrorists have their way. In your heart of hearts, do you think that this will just end up being instructive, as you mentioned before, for Americans, or that it will actually work 
to stop Trump from being on the ballot? You know, I have been so busy trying to help figure out how to do it right <laughs> and what the Constitution means that I have put away my little crystal ball. I'm not sure that it's uh, it's all that accurate anyway. So I'm just I'm just plotting away one foot at a time, and I'm not going to make long term predictions. Okay, fair enough. Though I like the crystal ball a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Professor Tribe. Thank okay, you. Thank you. That's constitutional law scholar and Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news on our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at www.bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And remember to tune into the Bloomberg Law Show every weeknight at 10 p.m. Wall Street time. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. Bloomberg.